I'm Amy Marshall Furness, the Rosamond Ivy Special Collections Archivist and Head of Library and Archives at the AGO. And I'm Marilyn Mazar, our AGO Archivist. Thanks for joining us to take a closer look at the view from the Art Gallery of Toronto in 1921. We're looking today at the land of the AGO, um, which is situated on Michisagig Nishnabe territory and is governed by a treaty between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Canadian government. The area of Toronto has been the land of other Anishinaabe peoples, the Haudenosaunee and Wendat confederacies, and the land is subject to the dish with one spoon wampa belt covenant. Today, it continues to be home to indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Um, and in this talk today, it's, um, it's really this land that we're concerned with um, and taking, taking a closer look at. Um, so I'm just gonna turn on, get to our next slide there. So here are the images. Um, Marilyn, do you wanna start just describing what we're looking at here? Yeah, so these are a, a series of very, uh, four uh, small black and white photos taken uh, in March of 1921 of the gallery grounds in 1921 fa facing north towards Dundas. Um, we don't know who the photographer was, but they were taken for an article that appeared in the Toronto Sun World, which was a Sunday edition of a daily paper called the Toronto World that was published between 1891 and to 1924. And it was it, these these photographs appeared in an article uh, entitled "Historical Jewel Set in Filth: Toronto's Art Museum." <laughs> so you can see that what the photographer uh, was trying to depict was the scruffy fields and the wood plank of a boardwalk uh, that was temporarily there. So the occasion, though, is uh, is I guess the completion of the gallery's first building. Um, which actually had to, actually had been completed somewhat earlier than this, I guess. But um... yeah, so where we are in history is World War One ended in 1918, and that was the same year the first three galleries of the Art Gallery of Toronto opened to the public. Though construction uh, wouldn't actually be complete until 1919, uh, the Spanish flu pandemic uh, was also just over in 1920. Uh, at the end of 1920. So, and Toronto, like many parts of North America and Europe was undergoing a recession. So that's what we're facing right now and probably why there was a bit of a delay in terms of even writing the article. Okay, so sort of a slow launch of this yeah. really quite monumental moment in the gallery's history and for the, for the um, city of Toronto as well to have, um, to have an art gallery for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of details here. So um, we've broken it down um, and we're going to take a look at a series of details of it just to sort of um, notice a lot of the, the details of these um, of these images. So here's this here's this unusual boardwalk, um, which is hard to imagine as the entryway to or the, you know, the approach to a gallery. Um, but maybe we should start by explaining where, like where the photographer would be standing in relation to today's building, if, if you know, imagining sort of us in the present day. Yeah, so um, to give a sense of where we are in the current space, the photographer would have been standing just to the east of the entrance of the ER Wood Gallery, uh, what was then known as the Long Gallery and was one of the first galleries built. Uh, so right now, the, the a person would be facing out into where Walker Court would be, and the other two galleries built in 19 were the Square Gallery just to the east of this, uh, which is now the Laidlaw Gallery, and the Octagonal Gallery to the west, which is now the uh, F.P. Wood Gallery. So right now, we'd be just at the right between the E.R. Wood Gallery um, and the Laidlaw Gallery. Okay. East. Yeah. Um, so all of this would be taken up by by building um, yeah. today, and this was yeah. this was the attempt to reach from what they were able to build at that date, which was much less, I guess, than they'd hoped to build, um, and then the main approach from Dundas Street. Yeah, well, the original architectural plans by Darling and Pearson included much more, of course, um, but because of all those conditions mentioned before the war, the Spanish flu, money shortages, and of course shortages of labor, so many young men. Uh, died with the Spanish flu and died in World, in, in World War I. Uh, what we see, even the pared down version happened in three phases, 1918, 1926 and 1935. So Walker Court wouldn't have been built until 19, 
26. And that was actually uh, where the inaugural uh, exhibition was and what the real launch happened, when the real launch happened of the, these uh, first iterations of the gallery. So to, to get a sense of kind of what, um, what the building looked like at this point, let's take a look looking in the opposite direction. So this is on Dundas Street now, um, looking down this boardwalk towards this um, building in the state that it was at that date. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it's interesting to note that the door that you see wasn't actually finished until 1919. Okay. So even the door wasn't finished. <laughs> so it was basically a long, a long box with very yeah. beautiful um, pilasters kind of along the side of it. Um, and I have some details of this just so we can see kind of what the scene was with the sign. Um, so zoomed in here, we can see the Art Gallery of Toronto because of course it wasn't called the Art Gallery of Ontario until the 60s. Yeah. Um, we have some pretty ambitious hours, which looks like seven days a week and I can't quite make out all the details. Um, but we thought we saw the admission price on here too. Uh, yeah, and it would have been about, it would have been 25 cents to get in and it, and it was that uh, for many, many years. In fact, it really didn't change significantly. I think it, it, it doubled, um, it, it, it doubled in price um, in the late 1960s and it pretty much stayed the same until the early 70s. Okay. Yeah. So pretty, uh, but, but a pretty accessible price, even at that date, I think we looked at it and it would be like 350 in today's dollars. Yeah. Um, and I just want to show the detail of these signs, which you can kind of see in the panorama shot from the from the reverse angle. Um, <laughs> but again, kind of an unusual thing to have to put in the front, the front yard, essentially, of an yeah. art gallery is, is no dumping. Um, and, and two of them, not just one, <laughs> but two no dumping signs. Just <laughs> may have may have been an issue, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting in terms of, um, I mean, I guess this is a transitional time, but but kind of speaks to perhaps a, a neglect or a, I don't know, just an odd moment in the gallery's history. Anyway, this is not super germane, but I did I did think it was cool to see um, zoom back out here. So you can see there's the sign, the entry sign is somewhere around here. Um, and then there's some of that signage. Yeah. Um, Okay, so our next look, we're going to kind of proceed from left to right here and take a, a closer look at some of these details. Uh, here is a stable also in the, front, in the front yard of the art gallery. Do you want to say a bit about um, the historic context for that? Yeah, so the stable would have been uh, the stable for the Grange House when it was occupied as a house. Uh, it was, of course, originally built by Darcy Bolton Jr. in 1817, uh, then belonged to his wife, Sarah Ann Bolton who conveyed it to her son, William Henry, uh, but because of his gambling debts, she reversed her decision. And um, his wife, Harriet, uh, inherited the house. So initially, just so you get a scope of the land, the property was originally 100 acres that ran from what we now know as Queen Street all the way up to Bloor, uh, McCall Street on the east side, right to Beverly. Um, and various parts of it had been sold off or donated. Um, uh, a, a big chunk of it to King's College is now part, part of U of T. Um, so now what we're looking at is probably about half of the original size, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm estimating, but I think it, we, what we have now is still sizable, but about half the original size of the estate. Okay. Yeah. So it's sort of a vestigial stable. It was probably useful in terms of storage of some kind, but we're not really sure why. Yeah, this would have been for. the back of the house where the gardens were. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, and where the, where the vegetable gardens were in the servants uh, quarters and so on. Yeah, at the back of the house. So it's not clear whether the art gallery might have used it because actually when we look at the next image, if we're just sort of panning slightly to the right, um, there's a lot of buildings here which in a sense remained um, because it wasn't actually easy to demolish at that point, was it? Yeah, we so uh, we got the Harriet uh, bequeathed the uh, house to the art, the art museum or now the AGO in 1902. And in 1903, the, an ordinance was passed that, we, that they could start expropriating properties for the building. Um, of the these were houses, like houses that people lived in along the yes. street. Yeah, so, yeah. and they're but still at the state. Because of uh, various housing shortages, uh, they couldn't, they couldn't um, evict, uh, they couldn't, expropriate all the properties and they couldn't evict people uh, right away. So a lot of uh, the properties were expropriated in about 1913. And then over the course of the next uh, 
10 years after that, the next decade. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, it's it a slow process. Emerging from a pandemic right now kind of, you know, feels really immediate, this circumstance in which there's like an, a real a serious ethic to, um, to the idea of eviction and, and removing housing. You can see here, I yeah. think like, I think what this represents is actually a gap where some houses have been demolished in the middle of these, and then yeah. the remaining ones um, that are just sort of waiting there. Um, yeah. And this actually gives a, another sense. So, so these are fire insurance plans, um, which can be found at the City of Toronto archives, but they give a really great sort of bird's eye view of what was going on um, in the land. They only issue these every several years to sort of reflect development in the city um, and assess things in terms of um, and the fire insurance regulations. Um, but you can see, so 1913 and then almost a decade later, and the, the image that we're looking at falls right in between the two of these. But in 1913, so there's the Grange House. Um, figure the stable that we see is probably one of these little buildings, the little yellow ones here, and then and then the full row of houses along Dundas Street. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we're, we're not seeing that side of the gallery over towards McCall because it was still it was still housing. Um, and not really part of the gallery, what the gallery was doing at that date. And then by 1924, here's our building with a little entrance. Yep, so the Walker Court there. hasn't been built yet, um, but you can see all the houses that are missing, right? Yeah, so it looks like demolition must have happened not long after the photo was taken. Um, yeah. And then our neighbor, now the Ontario College of Art and Design University has emerged as the Ontario School of Art in the interim. So it's right there um, next door neighbor. And they, I mean, I guess at some point in the future, we're going to, um, to demolish the houses that were then along McCall Street as well. So yeah, yeah, a lot of transformation. Um, yeah. And then here's a view that actually looks strangely familiar, even though this is a hundred years ago, um, of the north side of Dundas Street. It's a little blurry, but I've sort of zoomed out here. Um, yeah, so a lot of those buildings are still there, um, interestingly enough. and. Um, you know, by the late uh, 1800s, most of the, the gentry had moved to the four more fashionable neighbor, neighborhoods of Parkdale and, and Rosedale in the Annex. And by 1900s, trans, it, it transformed a lot into working class immigrant communities with row house workers and cottages. By 1914, the ward, uh, which is the neighborhood right next to um, the, the Spadina neighborhood, uh, a lot of the Jewish Eastern European um, immigrants had, had started to move. Um, westward into this neighborhood. So um, that's how it had changed. Uh, and working men's cottages built in the 1800s were later converted into these semi-detached homes and mansions. So you can see how the nice construction and yeah. yeah they're, I mean, they're quite beautiful. And actually we have Google Street View um, giving us a glimpse of what they look like today, which is actually surprisingly unchanged. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've got the Bougie Gallery here and the dental office. Um, and, you know, there's a few details and things that have been added to in the meantime, but it's it's pretty amazing um, that there they remain. So um, there we have I think it. It's, I think it's interesting, even if we look um, back at that slide too, just- um, Should we go back for a second? Yeah, just for a second, because we can see how, you know, iterations had changed over time. And just like that with the gallery, we can see, you know, the three iterations of the first phases of building are still there. The Grange House is still there. So every bit of our history of expansion is present in the gallery now. Yeah, pretty much, except the 1935, which got demolished for stages one and two in the early seventies. But basically you can see the entire history of the, of the gallery and the house still present in today's building. I, I think that's kind of interesting. It is. It's like I mean, the building itself is quite an archive because it, yeah, because yeah. it sort of unfolded slowly over time. There's never really been the resources to do a big grand master plan and execute it um, yeah. all at once. So, so there we have it. Um, you know, thinking very much these days about um, about land in relation to the gallery. I guess what this moment really represents um, historically would be a transition between one form of colonial control of the land, I guess, you know, the private ownership of the of the Grange, um, and then institutional control of the land through having the art gallery on this site. And it's a, it's a strange moment in which you can actually see the land itself um, 
underneath what was going to become Waka Court. Um, although, you although know, very neglected, very neglected. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you know, when it was an estate, these, this land would have looked very, very different as well, right? It would have been these beautiful gardens and vegetable gardens and, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's interesting to think that we're just over a century later than from when these photographs were taken, emerging from yet another pandemic rather messily and the very real possibility of a recession. And still the issues of gentrification and the lack of affordable housing have never been, I don't think stronger than they are now in Toronto. Um, so we're dealing with, you know, again, the same problems of colonialism that we were dealing with over a century ago are still existing today, I think yeah. in downtown Toronto. Yeah, I was, um, I was thinking about this um, obviously yesterday because we were preparing, but, but yesterday at the time we're recording was, was the solstice ceremony um, held at the art gallery with, with Walker Court being very much at the center of it. And, um, you know, it was a time that felt devoted to um, indigenous resurgence. Um, you know, we hope and, and, and movement towards reconciliation. And interesting to think about, um, you know, land that was going to become Walker Court essentially, which is, which is what we're seeing here. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's very apt that, um, you know, Walker Court has been a site of so much intervention by artists and um, more recently by ceremony, a way of reclaiming that land. Um, and certainly yesterday's, um, yesterday's ceremony, uh, a very healing ceremony um, uh, was very much, you know, that, that underpinned, that, under, that, was, that was underpinning it, I think, um, is a, rec a rec reclamation of so many things and a reckoning um, and a healing. Um, and that we're looking out onto where Walker Court hasn't been built yet. Just it was just an idea, <laughs> but lots to think about there. Lots to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for the conversation, Marilyn. Thank you. It was great. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us.